Okay, sorry if you're a uh, if you're one of the schools which have just disappeared. I think it's Kibera. Uh, uh, we've just been talking about this up here. Um, it's about how to write, uh, how to draw an energy um, profile diagram. Okay, so let's move on. Okay, so get them to draw lots of them. Get them to draw them and to talk about. How, what will make that large? Talk about the burning match. Where was the activation energy? Let's go back one. Where was the activation energy? Where was that for the match? What produced the energy of activation? Was it large? Was it small? How in scale does the difference between the reactants and the products compare with the energy of activation? And in the energy of activation for a match, the energy of activation for a match is very small compared with the, how, the heat given out to the uh, surroundings. That's why it gives out so much energy. Okay, on to Hess's law. So Hess's law says that the uh, overall enthalpy change, and this is for a multi-step reaction, depends only upon the initial and final states and is independent of the route taken. Um, People don't really believe this, you know, instinctively, students don't really get it. They don't believe that it's true. So you have to show them pictures. <coughs> Excuse me. So here's a picture of it. Um, I'm just going to try and get rid of something for myself. Right. Here's a picture of Hess's law. And what it's saying is that reactants and products, um, as long as they stay constant, the route taken is independent of them. But this picture doesn't really help us. In fact, this picture helps us more, or the one behind me, because the idea is to say, okay, if the reactants are at a fixed point energy-wise, and the products are at a fixed point energy-wise, if they went via a, an intermediate somewhere, which is the top of the energy of activation, then it doesn't matter whether we went directly from reactants to products, or via the intermediate, because the difference is still that blue arrow. So this is not necessarily very clear because we've just been using things up and down, which suggests that energy is going up and down, and then we do this. But it's true, and it's the way that we're going to construct the calculations. So what we do is let's take a real example. Let's take uh, ethene and hydrogen and turn it into um, ethane. But we can also do it via carbon and hydrogen. So we can decompose it into carbon and hydrogen and then we can recompose. Or we can say we know both of them from carbon and hydrogen. Now, sometimes this is a bit confusing to people. So I use a different way of doing it. I say, OK. Let's talk about a journey. And we're going to talk about going from Nairobi to Malindi, let's say. OK, and uh, to go to Malindi, uh, because the uh, C103 is not very safe, I would go via Mombasa. OK, and I'm going to ask myself which tickets I need to get from Nairobi to Malindi via Mombasa. And what's important about this is that sometimes the arrows are changed. So on the right here now, I don't have step two going from the intermediates to the products, but I've reversed the arrow. And that's like having the wrong ticket. So here we are, we go from Nairobi and we go to Melindi via Mombasa. And now, which tickets have I got? Well, I've got a ticket from Nairobi down here following the arrow to Mombasa, but I also have a ticket from Melindi to Mombasa. Well, I get on at Nairobi. I'm going to have the whatever it is, 11 hours on a bus. Ho, hurrah. Um, I'm going to get off the bus at Mombasa. I'm going to get on the next bus. And the bus guy is going to say, no, you can't because you've got a Melindi to Mombasa ticket. Ah, so I'm going to have to reverse that ticket. I'm going to have to go and get the return bit of it. And that helps some students understand what I'm talking about, that if I have arrows, it is only true that to go from Nairobi to Malindi across Route 1 is the same as Route 2, as long as Route 2 goes down to Mombasa and up to Malindi. In other words, I would have to um, reverse step two. That's important. 
So here's a, a real example. This is printed from a KCSE question, okay? It's wrong. I want you just to look uh, at this and see if you can spot what's wrong with it. Just, just have a little bit of a look. I mean, I know the arrows are missing, but that doesn't matter so much. There's something really rather serious missing. It's in the bottom line. If you look at the bottom line, it says that calcium and carbon dioxide makes calcium carbonate. Well, it doesn't, does it? What it should say here is that calcium oxide and carbon dioxide makes calcium carbonate, but this was printed in an examination paper. That's pretty poor. Anyway, let's do the, let's do the calculation. So how we do it. Now, most of you will know how to do this without any trouble, but we write the equation that we want across the top. And I always get the students to make it a really long arrow between them because I want to connect via the chemicals which are going to go at the bottom. When they've done that, I then ask them to look at all the equations above and find the most complicated chemical, which is calcium carbonate, and anything on the left which makes calcium carbonate. And I add that from the bottom. So I find the equation which goes Ca and carbon and three over two oxygens, one and a half oxygens, and I put it at the bottom and I draw an arrow up and I know that that in that direction is negative one, two, zero, seven kilojoules per mole. I then look at the other ones and I say, do the other equations fit this? Oh, well, see, I've rewritten it because it's calcium oxide here. So the top one is calcium and oxygen makes calcium oxide. Second one, carbon and oxygen makes carbon dioxide. So I make those arrows, carbon to carbon oxide, calcium to calcium oxide. The yellow arrow is worth negative uh, 394 and the greeny arrow is worth negative 635. I then say to them, OK, um, what am I going to have to do next? Well, here are the arrows. Here are the, what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to reverse these two because from, remember, Nairobi to Melindi is the same as Nairobi to Mombasa. Wait a minute. My tickets are from Mombasa to Nairobi. I need to reverse these two. So I reverse the green, reverse the yellow, and use the blue. So it's the reverse of 394, negative 394, the reverse of negative 365, 635, and plus negative 1207. So that's how it works. Only I think that the, the directions thing helps students understand that they have to reverse the numbers. Obviously, sometimes we might have a two carbon dioxides, in which case we're going to have to double that number anyway. OK. Bond enthalpies are, um, uh, there's only one little problem with bond enthalpies. If you start by talking to them with energy profiles and you say, well, in energy profile, let's say we took that example of methane burning, negative 890. So here's methane and a couple of oxygens at this level, and it's gonna end up with car two, a carbon dioxide and two waters. What's gonna happen in between? Well, the, the students will likely say, well, this all has to break up. And they know because they drew it earlier that that's the activation energy. And therefore, breaking bonds must be endothermic. And making the new ones must be, make, must be exothermic because it's opposite processes. So here we are. Here's a real example. So we've got uh, the dehydration of ethanol. So ethanol makes ethene and water. And we just have to make sure we count all the uh, bonds properly. This is where the students get it wrong. So here it is. Draw out the molecules first, draw them out completely. Don't draw COH, draw COOH. That's really important. And then I use bendomexo as a way of remembering it. I often have a little picture of a Mexican doing uh, some yoga. Uh, this is because I want them to remember bendo is breaking bonds is endothermic and making them is exothermic. Bendomexo. Really simple idea, bendomexo, a bit stupid, I know. It's often very stupid, my ideas. But bendomexo 
breaking bonds is always endothermic, making them is always exothermic. So what I do next is I go, okay, I'm going to work out what I need to break. So I go counting and I get my students to cross them out as they do them. Carbon to carbon, carbon to hydrogen and so on. Okay, so here we are. Here they are. The total of the ones that are broken, five carbon hydrogens, one car and so on, is positive endothermic. Bendo, positive. And on the left-hand side, sorry, on the right-hand side, the made are three to zero, three. And therefore, we just have to add those up then. There we are, positive 746, which is why ethene does not naturally become, sorry, ethanol does not naturally decompose to form ethene and water. Okay, we have just a few minutes, just five minutes, guys. Here's a little teaching idea, another one. This is a way of t uh, allowing the pupils, the students, to answer a lot of questions around the, the laboratory or the classroom. You need a few pieces of paper and students uh, in teams or individually, one per piece of paper. And you put the piece of paper round the room. Uh, on each piece of paper, you put a different question right at the top. So each team is standing by a piece of paper with a, a question at the top of it. They write their answer right at the bottom of the sheet, not at the top, at the bottom of the sheet. You give them a certain amount of time, let's say four minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, doesn't matter. Depends on the length of it. You have to find questions which are very similar for each one of the papers. So they write their answer at the bottom of the sheet. They then, when they've had that time, they fold the piece of paper over just at the bottom. So you can't, so nobody, the next team comes along, they can't read the question, sorry, they can't read the answer. So then they move on to the next question and the process repeats. And at the end of the lesson or towards the end of the lesson, the teams can present their answers or you can present them, you can look at them, they can correct each other and so on. This way, the students are going round the room answering questions, uh, having a different go each and then comparing their answers with other people. Of course, some will cheat. That doesn't matter in some ways. You want to try to get them to move while they're doing it and work together. Like Yestin said, some people don't work very well together and are happier to not do so. But you know, in work, sometimes you have to, and sometimes it's good for them just to practice this, even if they're not very good at it. Latent heat, very quickly before lunch. They are always physical changes. These are the things which you have to underline. Never use the word reaction with latent heat. Do not use it, please. Use change, don't use reaction. Ask them to name and describe some, they know them. Ask them to describe what happens in terms of particle arrangement and energy and movement. That will not be so successful. You can talk to them about that. At any level, they not all of them will understand what is happening to the particles, but the diagrams are very useful. See if they know what happens to temperature when a piece of ice melts. Do they, do they think it gets hotter? When water is boiling away, do they think it gets hotter than 100? Use a diagram. This is not a great diagram, but it helps because it includes plasma for those people those students who are really quite advanced and want to know about that. Um, and they will get most of these. If, if they want to call vaporization boiling, that's fine. They probably won't get, they might get sublimation, they won't get deposition, but they should know them. Okay, you can then give them a table, you can get them to draw out a table, empty table, and we can talk about what happens movement. Oh, they're only vibrating, they're moving fast, they're moving very fast, etc. etc. The particles of gas in a room are colliding about five million times a second. That's quite quick. Attraction, well, this is about the ability to, which is about how, um, how close they are together. Um, I'm not going to worry about that bit. So, oops, sorry. The, this I will leave this slide for you to see. This is, a, this is a little explanation from a group who do 
very short explanations which are very useful for explaining things that hyperlink will take you to that i want to stop on these two slides now this is chloroform used to be used in anesthetics uh, chcl3 um, a uh, melting point of negative 60 a boiling point of 60. Uh, and th this is quite useful because this is a chemical which the students have never come across. Ask them what is happening. Show them it. Ask, why has it gone flat? What is happening when it goes flat? If they can't come out with an answer, show them this one. Ah, this one's water because it's zero and 100. What is happening here? You can tell them that the heat is continuing. You could have a little diagram here where you show a beaker with an ice cube in it and with a flame underneath it, a, a spirit burner or a Bunsen or whatever. And then they may get the idea that actually that angle there is the same up to the horizontal, is the same as afterwards and therefore very similar. And therefore the heating was continuing, but the temperature was not increasing. And that is very important. And that is what they want to do. Um, it is also possible using these to talk about how we know whether something is solid, liquid or gas at room temperature. And it's very simple. As long as they can remember that room temperature is around about 25, then they are OK. So they go ah, solid, solid and liquid, liquid. Ah, at 25, this one is a liquid. Chloroform is a liquid at, at room temperature. Okay, so we're going to uh, stop now because it is, uh, I think, time for lunch. Wow, lunch? You get lunch? I don't get lunch. Could somebody hang on to some lunch and send it to me? Please? Somebody, some of the nice guys in Kibera, they, they, they'll do it. No, actually, they're looking really hungry. Maybe they'll just eat it all. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. We will continue with energy and move on to organic after lunch. Um, I will be showing you the latent heat little video after lunch. But now I believe you are free to go and have a nice time. I hope that was a little bit useful. We will go on and do a little bit more. And the particularly the um, calculations from energy experiments later. But now you're free. Oh, Thank you. <coughs> thank you very much, guys. Thank you, thank you very much, Jamal. Thank you, guys. Thank you. See you later. It was a wonderful, a, was a wonderful session. Thank you. Are you having a good lunch? Do you know, Michael? Yeah, yeah. We're having a good lunch. You're welcome. I, I'd like to come. <laughs> ugali, yeah. Ugali. You, you'll take Ugali. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I eat Ugali. Are, they going, are you gone? Oh, no. <laughs> that is so unfair. Karibu oh. sana. <laughs> Some sometime I'll come across and then I will. Okay. 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 Gotta be honest. I'm glad I'm not there eating ugali. I like ugali. <laughs> I do. <laughs> Maybe I'm a Kenyan at heart. Yeah. Anyway, have a good time. I I uh, I, I hope you have a really good lunch, guys, and uh, look after yourselves. So, uh, yes, then I'm going to disappear and come back at 11.15 for us. Okay. Take care. Your system was, your, your, what's it, your system? Your presentation was very good, mate. Really? Yeah. Genuinely, very, very good. Well done. Okay. Well, thank you. Pleasure. See you later. Yeah. Be good. Bye bye. Behave. Bye. Behave. If you can. Ho, ho, ho.